is Counter Mentors with Kelly and Robbie Riggs. Finally, a place where you can get both perspectives on challenges in the workplace from a boomer and a millennial. The Counter Mentor is the new leader. Join us as we show you how to blend the very best of both generations, young and old. This is Counter Mentors, and here are your hosts, Kelly and Robbie Riggs. Well, we both disagree on that, 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 that our generation, millennials, of course, for the first time in human history, we bring more to the workplace than ever before. Like so what? The, 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 the old guys just can't handle it. Uh, hey, we're excited here. We got show number, what do we got? Number 12. 12. Yeah. Show number 12. And we have a really, really special treat. We've, we've heard your feedback uh, that, that we, you love when we have an author or, or someone with an outside opinion to beat the two of us up a little bit. Um, we got no a, pressure, David we Burkus. we got a great one on tap yeah, today, Mr. David Burgess. We're going to give him his very heralded, very prestigious introduction that he deserves. Yeah, um, We're, we're going to do that later in the show, uh, but we are excited that you are with us here on the Counter Mentors podcast. So um, Pops, first and foremost, uh, check us out, countermentors.com, at countermentors on Twitter. Um, we love hearing from you. Shoot us an email, KR, that's Kelly and Robbie, KR. No, it's Kelly Riggs. KR at countermentors.com. Uh, we have, we'd love to hear from you, things you want to talk about, things you want to hear. And Pops, what I want to do first before we jump into anything, and let's talk about last week. Where Last we week was freaking awesome. Team, <laughs> team building we, is we, a train wreck. We figured out it's an absolute Okay, I only, I only really remember one thing from last week. <laughs> awesome. That's, yeah. that's that old guy mind that you guys I, I'm up. very limited bandwidth. <laughs> when, when, you get, when you get north of 50, uh, your hard drive gets full. Uh, but it was paintballing. You know, the, the team building activities, dude takes his group out for paintballing. First thing out of the shoot, accidentally discharges one right in the boss's garage. Awesome. Why is that funny? That's awesome. just lots of like bad it's, humor, it's, but it's, it's terrible. terrible. And you don't like Will Ferrell movies. I don't understand. Uh, no, um, I do. I really do. So what we talked about team building last week is that the idea, the premise of bringing your team together, building a cohesive team that has great relationships, study after study shows us that that's absolutely imperative to being a high performer. However, study after study also shows us that people don't know how to do team building. Yeah, the way you're going about it is a train wreck. Absolute Let me just look cut to here's the cliff notes. <laughs> train wreck. There you go. That's it. You know, but we did talk at length about how to do it right, a lot of a lot of tips and ideas. So make sure you find us on countermentors.com. Oh, by the way, do what we do, download the podcast on iTunes. Sync it up with Bluetooth. How, how's that for some tech I'm savvy, impressed. right? Yeah, Sync impressed. it up with your Bluetooth in your car. Listen to and from work. Some really great episodes. And uh, yeah, we have a good time with it. We've had some fantastic shows. It all started way back with our buddy Jim Keenan. When we got started, old school is definitely dead. And That's then right. we, we did things like um, I didn't get a trophy or I didn't win, but I got a trophy. Yeah. You can relate to that, I'm sure. Um, no, I, I always won. You have a whole room full of trophies. Okay, hold on. I gotta just interrupt you. For those of you that can't see at home, we we've had some te technical difficulties. I mean, this looks nice and clean on, on, on the pod uh, or on the shot on this Blab, is a real studio. But this is an absolute nightmare back here. I whoa, mean, whoa, whoa. Did, well, your boy didn't you write a book called Awesomely Simple? Nothing <laughs> about this is simple. Uh, hey, by the way, great, uh, great segue. John Spence will be on I mean, the show in a couple of weeks. Oh my! And I can't wow. wait to get his perspective because he's old guy like me. But he is very seriously tuned into the millennial side of things. So, hey, we hope you'll uh, find us at Counter Mentors on Twitter, as he mentioned, and follow us individually at Kelly Riggs, at Robbie Riggs. We're really excited to get our guests online in just a few minutes, uh, right. a little after 10 after the hour. Yep. We'll have at David Burkus on to join us, talk about his brand new book, 
under new management. Yeah, no, we're pumped about that. But, but before we do that, um, we got to We have to tell the people at home. I mean, we have our regular listeners listening on the pod on Blab. We got to tell the people about Job Pact. Absolutely I mean, right. they've taken care of us. Our friends at Job Pact, um, for those of you that absolutely hate trying to find good people, we hear it everywhere. Absolutely. It's hard to find good people. We can't find them. We have our partners at Job Pact have created a tool that helps you find great people. And you know what? You don't need a degree in HR. We love our friends at Sherm and the HR world, but you don't need a degree in order to find the great people we use. All Job you Pact. need is the right tool. And Job Pact is the right tool. Access to over 100 million resumes. And this is a tool that was created by recruiters who used to be in that industry, former recruiters, and they want everyone to have the ability to hire the best. Their unique algorithm connects your job requirements to absolutely the right people, puts it together, connected them to another client this week. That's right. Really going well. Shout out to Alex and Intuna and the guys over at Job Pact. By the way, we have a special offer. We do. Go to our bit.ly link, bit.ly forward slash Job Pact. Capitalize the J and the P. You're going to get 30 days of Job Pact absolutely free. That's real free. Hire real as free. many people as you want. That's right. That's yeah, right. Good stuff. And we really enjoy it. Real free. One thing pops access to over 100 million resumes through Job Pact. We're, we're really, really excited about that. And, and we have David Burgess on today who we are really excited about wrote an outstanding book. We can't wait to argue with him. I mean, it, it's going to be fun. Um, but before we get into it, we want to lead this up because uh, Burgess's book, um, talks about this, the new and approved, uh, what, what we're calling the millennial, millennial approved. approved. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're trying the millennial to, yeah. approved workplace. Um, and there's a few things we've talked about this a lot on the show. Uh, for those of you that have listened in the past, we, we've talked a lot about what a millennial wants out of their job. And we've argued about it a lot about how different it is. I'm and, right. You're not. Well, that's, but whatever. That's pretty much why millenn no millennials will work for him. Um, <laughs> but wait, 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 wait. <laughs> don't you work with me with, with, not with. for, okay, not for. Gotcha. <laughs> um, but I want to talk about this. So Two key things, uh, and and again, we're going to really dive into some of these in detail once we give David on in about four or five minutes. But a couple of key stats that we got from our friends at Gallup, they just did a study called How Millennials Want to Work and Live. Um, and there was a couple of key As things. if you could really synopsize that down into one small article because millennials are, you know, they're, they're, they're uh, sensitive. And synopsize? It, it, Summarize. Synthesize? Sum Synopsize? Yeah. Hey, go to- I think the gray hat is all the they, power in your gray hat. You're wearing your brown hat today. Hey, and I don't, hey, I don't it's know. It's a college word. But here's the thing. Little <clears throat> snowflakes, they need special things, Boomer. So pay attention. All right. All right. 19%. This is crazy. 19% of millennials say they receive routine feedback. One in five. Not even two out of 10. <laughs> Yeah, not even divide by the fraction. Not even one in five. Not even one in five. We're yeah. saying the same thing. <laughs> but my okay. Better. So millennials want regular <laughs> feedback. All right, and in this huge survey that Gallup did, so th that's the point of the deal is they only twenty percent are getting it roughly, but but they actually want it in a big way. Right? Even smaller than that, when asked, even those that are getting it, only seventeen percent of the of respondents who said they actually get feedback, only seventeen percent said that it was actually meaningful. So so when we do get feedback. It's not meaningful. And here's what it sounds like. Pull your pants up. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's not we, good. We talked about that phrase. We can't. We we <laughs> lawsuits or we can't. Yeah. We can't. Use okay, that and retake. That's okay. right. That's right. So, but, but here's the thing. Um, unfortunately for my millennial brethren, uh, and I know we have some uh, watching here on Blab, and I know we have a lot that listen to the pod. Um, only 15 percent of us. Now I'm looking at you guys. Only 15 percent of us say that we actually ask for feedback. So. It's easy for us to blame the old guys and say they don't know how to manage. They're micromanaging. They want us to do it their way. But we have to absolutely ask for feedback if we want it. Yeah, so, well, hang on a second. I, I'll give you that. But that's at huge. the same time, boomer leaders, really? I mean, you, people do better work when they know how they're doing. Right. So I know that's a struggle. But uh, we're going to talk a little bit about one-on-one -on -one meetings and feedback in future uh, episodes. But listen, you got to get with the program here. Feedback is what enables people to do good work. So that's part of the millennial approved workplace. That's just part of a good workplace period. Yeah, let me right? put a bow on this. Uh, this is, quote, engagement is highest among employees who meet with their manager at least once a week. Um, you should be meeting with your people. You hear us advocate for the one-on-one -on -one meeting all the time. You meet weekly with your people. As the pop said, you set expectations, you set key objectives and metrics. And, and I mean, engagement goes through the roof. Productivity goes through the roof. I mean, that that's that's all we need to know about asking for feedback. All right. So that's what Gallup said? That's what Gallup Engagement told. is highest when you're meeting once a week. That's what our, yeah. Who advocated? Who wrote about that in a book? Didn't somebody, hold on. We're in Pops' studio. I, oh. I think we have one this. I get to do this commercial. One-on-one <laughs> -on -one management. Here oh, that's shameless. All right, let's move along. Come on, here All right, we go. so listen to this. Millennials want jobs to, I don't know, be development opportunities. They want to get better. 
Daniel Peake wrote, wrote the great book Drive. We talk about it all the time. He says one of the key things that drive Look, we're people, paying you. Just do your job one of already. The key things that drive people is a sense of mastery. I'm working towards something. In in the same study, it revealed that 59% of millennials say opportunities to learn and grow are are extremely important to them for applying for a job. I'll sit down, I shut up, and I'll teach you something. I don't want to just sit here and click a button because I'm told to. I want to understand. Why not? I want to feel like there's an opportunity for to, to grow. <laughs> An impressive 87% of millennials say that, quote, professional career growth and development are the most important thing for them in staying at a job. Absolutely. Big engagement driver is when you feel like you're going somewhere. And by the way, boomer managers, how about you care a little bit about where your people are going? I, you know, one of my favorite quotes still of all time, and it goes way back. I see it on Facebook from other people all the time. And right. I'm like, no, no, no. You need right. to give it to the man, Zig Ziglar. Right. And he said, I would rather train my people and have them leave than not train them and have them stay. Stick that one in the quote box. That's yeah, a good one right there. That's that's brutal. That's brutal. So finally, the, the last quote that we're going to get out of this before we bring our man on. Managers need to recognize that millennials don't feel entitled. They feel empowered. We have oh, knowledge. Now, we're bringing, you had credibility. We have knowledge there. we're bringing into oh, the workplace. Please. We have great experiences. We understand digital. We understand tech. And you know what? Um, empower us. Let us do it. And oh, you know please. what? Before you don't feel entitled. Are you kidding me? I I, I need to get on plane. All right. On the other <laughs> side of this break, we're going to bring the man on, David Burkus, and we're going to talk more about the millennial approved workplace. We'll hey, be right back. Stay with us. Hey, welcome back. Great to have you on Counter Mentors. And we got David Burkus going to join us live on Blab. By the way, we do it every Monday, and currently we do it at 4 p.m. Central, although we're thinking about moving it to a better time if, if it makes more sense to you, our listeners. For you people listening to the podcast, you couldn't care less. But if you like to do it, <laughs> if you like to do it live here on Blab with us, and it is a lot of fun, chat bar, we get a little chat going on the side, and we get to bring in the big boys like uh, David Burkus. But 4 o'clock Central Time on Mondays, you can always join us live, and we love to have you. David Burkus is the author of Under New Management, how leading organizations are upending business as usual. And he joins us here live on the pod, live on Blab. David, great to have you with us, man. Thanks for being here. Oh, it's it's great to be here. Thank you all so much for having me. It's been fun to watch your banter for the past 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> he stayed away. I, yeah, I, yeah he did. I, right. Well, yeah, I, I pay him a lot of money to act like he enjoys it. So it, it, it seems to, it whoa, seems whoa, to whoa, Time out. He's getting paid for this? No, you. Oh, oh, you meant You're me. Getting, you yeah. meant me. Oh, okay. Wait, 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 right. He's getting paid. Say, I, I need to get paid. I don't know. What you're hey, uh, about. Yeah, let's, let's change subjects right here. I'm getting in trouble. Hey, David, it's great to have you. And of course, we're talking about the new millennial approved workplace. It's kind of a segue into, you know, a lot of what Robbie and I do is helping boomers understand millennials. Millennials understand boomers meet in the middle and leverage both of their strengths. But the workplace is changing pretty dramatically. Your new book, Underdue Management, talks about it at length. What, uh, in, in your mind, as you went through the book, what was the biggest sort of, wow, aha, this is crazy kind of revelation that you got in your research? Yeah. I, well, so, so to set it up and, and to the sort of countermeasures audience, the, the thing that really compounds the debate between millennials and boomers, et cetera, is that the nature of work has also shifted, right? Sure. So we were, we were in this, tr you know, traditional uh, factory work, then we're in knowledge work. And really, even in the last 20 years, we're in much more of a creative form of knowledge work, right? So yeah. we've got to, we're not making products anymore. We're solving problems. We're sure. coming up with ideas. We're doing all that sort of stuff. In terms of the ideas in the book, I mean, the book is basically a collection of now that the nature of work has shifted, what are the companies that are in the forefront of managing that new type of work? What are they like? Right. The, probably the biggest one I was not expecting was the transparency piece. The idea oh, yeah. that you have more yeah. to gain from letting everybody know what everybody gets paid. That one, I mean, I started researching it and I didn't do a full 180, but let's call it like 167 degree <laughs> turn, something like that. Because I started out with like, okay, this is uncomfortable. This is a little weird. And then I, I heard the stories of the companies that did it. I dug into the data that really supports the idea that when people know that they're getting paid fairly, they know how the system works and how to move up in the system. No surprise if people know how to make more money by doing better work, they do better work so they can make more money. It's kind of logical when you think about it for more than like two minutes. Right. But that was the biggest thing is I had to think about it for that long and, and fight my own urge of like, well, this is private. This is weird. This is uncomfortable. 
Uh, and then the truth is, you know, I found a lot of research that the, even the privacy thing, thing is very cultural, right? There are a lot of sure. more collectivist cultures across the country that are more uh, open to that idea. And then even to some extent, they all like the same low pay, right? So <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter, right? Yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> but even even from a generational standpoint, you know, there's a greater call for transparency now. I think that the millennial is more used to sharing everything about them because they grew up with Facebook almost as a native, right? Mm -hmm. Um, that I, I, I wish there'd been more studies on that. I'm waiting for them, but there's a lot of kind of anecdotal studies that suggest overall transparency. I've yet to see one that's the exact one generation prefers pay transparency more, but overall we see, we definitely see a shift, um, in younger workers. Maybe it's not even generational. Maybe it's just age, younger workers being comfortable with a higher level of transparency. Well, and let's, let's start there, Dave, because I really enjoyed your book went through, I think the way it's organized, it's simple. It's easy to follow. It's a great read. Absolutely. Um, so let, let, Thank let's you talk lying. about this idea. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk <laughs> about this idea of open pay for all. So, you know, being in, in the business of helping to develop high performers, you know, we do uh, lots of engagement surveys. We do lots of, to get a baseline to then see where things are going. We over and over and over hear about, well, you know, the people at the top are making too much money and, and the executive team is making too much money. So on one hand, I feel like I, you could convince me of, well, that'll help because we'll actually see how much they're making. Right. right. And it's not as much as they think. But on the other hand, it could be, wait, hold on. They just hired Kelly and he's from the outside and he doesn't understand what we do. And he makes 20% more than I do. Well, clearly so, that's a good call. Well, I, I mean, that, that's a very, very unrealistic example. You're, <laughs> you're right. You're right. Oh, um, but, but my point is, would that be an equal demotivator to low performers? Would that be a good thing? I mean, t talk more about how you think that motivates or demotivates certain sects of your organization. Yeah. So, so for starters, let me, let me say this. If you don't have a uniform, system that's applied equally to how you set pay across the organization transparency is the worst thing you could do ah, right okay so gotcha. start there right. have a fair system and and you, and you're right like we a lot of times pay is set by supply and demand at the time we hired the person yeah, that's that right. can be you know because of recessions or spikes mm -hmm. in the economy that could just be because of who we found right. so we're willing to pay more in times where it's harder to find good people Right. Yep. And that doesn't play out over time because what you get is, you know, we brought in Kelly five years ago when the market was better. So he's better paid than, you know, than you are because right, we so. brought you in now when there was a willing supply of unemployed people who can do the job. <laughs> so awesome. So you're just, you're just part now, of the yeah, supply. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm a awesome. supply and demand guy. Awesome, right. awesome. So having a, a uniform system you can point to is, is the first step, right? And now right. most organizations believe that, right? Most organizations strive for that. So making that public has a huge motivational element because exactly what you said, we're actually really terrible at guessing what people's salaries are. We're, <laughs> yes. we're awful at it. And the research suggests we do it all the time. We're always looking for little cl clues, right? Oh, how big, yeah. how big oh, is yeah. their office? How many windows does it have? What kind of car does it leave in the did park? Did you see that lot? new car they just got? That's right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Oh, you already got the new iPhone? Oh, oh yeah. it must be nice. I actually saw an executive get a new Beamer and every, I mean, it was the talk of the entire organization for a week about how they didn't get bonus and he's driving big cars and all this right. craziness. Right. Right, totally. So, so we're already bad at that, and and we're constantly faced with uh, psychologists call it equity theory. We feel mm -hmm. distress when we feel like pay is not equitable. When we feel like I give a ten and I get paid a ten, and you give a ten and get paid a fifteen, that's not right. fair. Right. So we're more likely to either look for somewhere else to work or slack off a bit to try and restore equity. Those type of things. So if you've got a fair system, you have nothing to lose and everything to gain from making that fair system public. How you do that, how transparent you get depends on a lot of cultural factors. But right. the truth is, in a mystery condition, in a secrecy condition, we're just awful at judging what each other makes. And so we most often guess wrong. And that adds way more stress than there than would be there if we just were open about it. Right. Hey, you're listening to episode number 12, the new millennial approved workplace right here on Counter Mentors. Our special guest is David Burkus. Follow him on Twitter at David Burkus, and you can find him online, davidburkus.com. He's got quite uh, quite the resume, TEDx speaker, author, a couple of books now. We're talking about his brand new one, Under New Management. And that, between the both of us, both Boomer and Millennial, that was the one that jumped all over the both of us. But the second one that jumped all over us was the elimination of email. I mean, <laughs> advocating that we don't use email. Why don't you just go drop a grenade in the home office? Seriously. <laughs> So, I mean, we, we have a love-hate relationship with email, right? It's, it's uh, absolutely, yeah, right. Mostly hate, but yeah. yeah. Well, 
But we also like if I pulled it away from you, you'd go, how how would I ever get anything done, right? Right. Absolutely. So we I mean we love email because it's cheap and it's asynchronous, right? We can send a ton of it for virtually nothing. And we can send it whenever we want, and it doesn't matter. It's not like a phone call where I have to be in the office and you have to be in the office at the same time. Right. The problem is it's cheap and it's asynchronous. So we send <laughs> yeah. a ton of it. <laughs> exactly right. right. And, and we send it whenever we want. And you know, this this honestly, this wasn't a problem until around 2007, 2008 when iPhone, Android, all of that really scaled. Yeah. Back right. in the days when only like high-level execs that we were paying to be on 24-7 had Blackberries, this wasn't as big as an issue. But now, like if you have one of these. By definition, you take your work home with you every single day. Yeah. Right. So you're not getting the time that you need to be at home to recharge, to make yeah, investments I mean, in your so, family well, I, and your I friends. just want to make sure I understand. Are you are you advocating for really getting rid of it? I mean, someone like me who is traveling full time, for example, these past two weeks, I'm working with a client. I'm visiting all their different locations all over the U.S., I mean, w without my email, my ability to stay plugged in with my team, right. I mean, that would be really, really tough. I mean, are am I hearing you right where you're saying, I think we should get rid of it? So so every company is different, but I've seen a lot of success in the companies that have gotten rid of internal email. Now, obviously, external customers, you, you got to communicate with a customer how a customer wants to be communicated with. Right. But internally, I mean, Atos is a 70,000 plus French IT company that basically said, you know, we can make a better tool. And the, the tool looks a bit like a mix of like Slack Facebook and, a, and an old school message board. Oh, and, okay. And so this so is, just, I'm not saying, right. I'm not saying do away with digital communication, but let's right. be honest, like email was not invented to do the job that we're asking it to do now. I and totally, I mean, all, I totally, totally yeah. agree with that. Yeah. So meaningful conversations aren't happening. The, the push result on it, that it's constantly interrupting you wherever you are. I mean, to, it, to your point, Robbie, there are times where you need to be focused on the client because you were traveling around to visit said client. That's right. What you don't need is to be distracted by unimportant stuff that gets to ping your phone just like the important stuff does. So yeah. those kind of systems are a whole lot better for that internal communication. So we see a lot of companies that are migrating to that. More common than that, though, is just setting restrictions on it, setting days of the week or times of the day where we just collectively, we don't do internal email. Either, and a lot of the first thing we should do is at night, but yeah. also even times during the day, like carving out between 10 and, and 12, we just don't do email, we don't do meetings. This is our focused individual, leave me alone to get the work done time. There's a lot of benefits from not being distracted during the normal work day too. Yeah, and that, that's really common among among tech companies, right? It's you have blackout periods, no e yeah. no meetings, no email from eleven to two, so people can code and get work. Yeah, but but hang on, I'm, I want to chase a rabbit here just a little bit, David. You know, it's a real problem inside a lot of workplaces. The twenty four seven connectivity, a lot of executives and managers, that's almost a requirement, if not explicitly, implicitly, by the way they communicate. I mean, what is the impact of that? And if and if you're working with a company trying to get them to sort of standardize some of these blackout periods or whatever. How, how do you do that? I mean, my sense is if I'm on 24 seven, I never get to rest. I never actually get to re re-energize or anything. How big of a problem is that? So, I mean, it's, it's a pretty huge one. We labor under this misconception, especially in the West, especially in the United States, that we should brag about how little sleep we're getting and how many hours we're working. Right. I'm out. And we have that. In, in terms of productivity, in knowledge work, in coming up with ideas and solving problems, we, right. we should probably okay. inverse that. We should brag about how much sleep we're getting, so how much time our brain is recharging, mm -hmm. and then how we're able to do the job we're hired to do in the least of, the amount of time, right? Because there's no, it's not like working on an assembly line. There's no connection between the number of widgets and the time spend you, day, you spend a day at the factory. It, it's really a lot more dependent on how much time you can actually focus in and do it. And honestly, I mean, let's let's be totally honest. An eight-hour workday in a knowledge work organization, if you had uninterrupted focus time and no meeting schedule that day, you could probably get everything done by lunch. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's, let's 100% agree. 100% agree. So, and then I could pay you half as much. And that would be awesome. You don't pay me anything. I don't, what, what are we talking uh, about? You're here? just, yes, you're just zero divided the, in half is still zero. Yeah, thank, thank you. <laughs> hey, I, I mean, he's a professor. He gets it. This is this is too hard for you. I, I, I know. I want to ask. Hey, are you here. impressed? I knew what Slack yeah. was. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask a follow up here though. So, David, do you see this this time and, and the how much I work as a badge of honor? Do you see that more in a boomer executive or or a boomer manager, or is that seen across the board? I mean, uh, what, what's your sense on that? What's your take? Yeah, on great it? question. Okay, so I don't have anything other than anecdotal evidence, which is we'll, we'll professor speak for just my observations, not real data. 
Um, I actually, I see it more dependent on industry um, and on the sort of upward mobility of the individual, right? So people who are in high performance industries where it's up or out, so consulting, law, those type of things, those are far more prone to brag on this kind of stuff and, right. and far less prone to realize that you actually need rest and recharge yeah. um, than are others. And then especially by personality, it's those people who really are trying to do a 30 year career in 20 years type of people that really brag on it. The, the irony being though, the fact that they're working in the office 12 hours a day, they're still getting probably eight hours or even seven hours worth of work done. Oh, sure. um, just because you hung out until your boss left doesn't mean you're doing productive work. No, that's, no, that's, that's, no, that's, that, that, that's exactly okay. right. So my, my I, I got to write that my down. next follow up on this, I think, is relevant to this whole discussion, which is, at, at, as you said, David, in your intro, the, the rules of work, the, the type of work we do have changed. I think there's a difference between having the badge of honor of I worked from six to six, then went home and powered up and worked for another four hours. Right. And, you know, I can get up and do more from six to nine in my robe on my couch than this guy can do in a week because of my ability to get connected and do everything. So I think there's a difference in how we work now. So be, going at home, going at home in the evening and, and working, you know, with a glass of wine on, on the couch or the kitchen table doesn't necessarily mean that you're overworking. It means you're choosing to work in a different way. W would you agree with that? Yeah, totally. But I mean, I the, think the that was a leading question. Yeah, I know, right? Was, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Do you agree with that, huh? Please, please. <laughs> yeah, the, the challenge is the type of work you're doing, but also, you know, what you said there had a, an air of control to it. You decided that, right? right? Right. When when my boss emails me at eleven thirty and my phone goes off while I'm also trying to get my two year old to sleep, and now I feel pressure to also respond to their thing. That's not my choice, and that's when we get into a problem. Got it. Okay. So definitely yeah. that, that difference is that feeling of autonomy or control versus right. I'm on a, I'm on a digital leash and I have to respond no matter what. Right. And, and that's, and that's the challenge is even though we wouldn't say it, I mean, most managers I think a in the U S would actually like say, that. we don't want people to respond to email after work, but the fact that they're sending it sends a subtle signal that it's sort of expected, right? If, if, you if, treat yeah. people how to respond to you. And so when you're doing it, you're treating people, you're, you're subtly telling people that this is, should be the new norm. Hey, if, whether you're an executive, a boomer, a millennial, really doesn't matter. You need to read Under New Management, the brand new book by David Burkus. He's our guest today, live here on Blab. And of course, if you're listening to the, the podcast on iTunes, uh, we hope you'll take just a moment and go and say something good about the podcast on iTunes. Rate and review the podcast. Shameless plug right there. Uh, David, one of the things that uh, we, we talked about before the show, show prep, another one of the really big points that you hit is, our managers necessary. And it seems like some of the data that's just floated out recently is saying, yeah, absolutely they are. But uh, in your book, maybe there's a different kind of approach to that. What What's the most current? Yeah. So I, I think the data you're, you're referring to is actually the, the big Google experiment that yes. Laszlo Bach talks yes. about, right? And, and I think it's important to understand the way that that study was done. That study proved that managers were necessary at Google. Right. Because they didn't do multiple companies. So it doesn't we don't know company wide. Now, right. the other thing is you've got to dig in and understand what the role of a manager at Google is. And it's a lot more of an inverted hierarchy at Google anyway. Right. So right. it isn't the top is, yes. down. I give you things to say. It's much more of an inverted. The manager's job is to help you get the resources that you need to help you understand what other people are, are doing and how it coordinates with yours. It's it's very much more like a coach to an athlete than it is like a, uh, and you can hold up a one-on-one -on -one coaching book again, Kelly, I'm sure you've got something around coaching, <laughs> but it's very wow. much more nice. that role. I like so, <laughs> so yes, we're probably never going to do away with that. In fact, we probably need more of it. The challenge is the, the management was invented essentially because we had two tiers of people. We needed another tier. We had the factory, the labor people, and then we needed someone who could keep them coordinated, someone who knew the whole picture because, I mean, literally the guys who first started writing about management thought labor was too dumb to know the whole picture. Yeah, and Frederick Taylor had some really nice things to say about yeah. laborers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and interestingly enough, I mean, the guy was like a benevolent dictator. He really believed that his ideas were in their best interest because right. they were too dumb to figure it out, but they could maximize their pay if they just I listened to the manager. Guy. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah. For, yeah. A couple of those. <laughs> so, so this idea, though that the manager knew everything and labor just needed to shut their brain off we don't we don't work like that anymore i mean nowadays a manager especially in a flatter organization is charged with keeping track of four or five different types of roles types of jobs and almost every situation in a knowledge work organization the people doing the work know way more about how to do that work 
right. than does the manager. And so when that's the case, the, the task of management needs to fall to those people. So I don't know that we ever do away with management as a function, you know, tracking resources, tracking timelines, setting objectives, measuring performance, all of those sort of things. But in, a, in an age where the people doing the work know more about the work to be done, a lot of that is best left over to those people. Mm -hmm. And the manager job looks a lot more like uh, it does at Google, which is much more of a support role than a dictate role. Yeah, I mean, it, that's so much of what you've described is what we coach and try to teach the difference between managing and leading. I mean, that's just another way of saying what you're saying as a coach and bringing someone along and caring about their development and communicating to them and all those things and <clears throat> pushing more of that you know, bringing up other people up to speed, communicating work progress and, and, and task updates. I mean, that can all be done interpersonally. I don't need a manager to tell me that. So I can definitely see the importance of that. Uh, and you kind of uh, headed me off the pass on my question, which is the importance of that uh, communicator and that developer, um, you know, to inside of an organization. So if, as we think about the way that you coach and you develop your people, is, is there a difference in term? Do we need to change the, the language we use when we talk about a manager or, I mean, not to be cheesy, but say, do we need to start calling them leaders or, well, or coaches or coaches? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so here's, here's semantics are weird. Like I, I've never known a leader that isn't also a good manager or who's second in command isn't also a good manager. And I've never known a good manager that doesn't have good leadership abilities. So, so we have that semantic thing um the act I mean, let me, can i stop you right there yeah i just want to give you props for that because i get so tired of this managers and leaders are different and all that i know there's some fine line distinctions right but here's the reality if you're a manager and people work for you you're a leader get over it. yeah but you okay hold are. on though but but i think that it, calling yourself a leader and this goes back to the the archetype of, of what we think a leader is going back a thousand years when i think leader that to me is someone who has earned that title just because you hand me a business card that says manager, no, 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 and I, hold, no. hold on, and I have four people under me, that yeah. doesn't make me a leader. Yeah, it does. The only question is, as I say, the only question is, are you any good at it? You but, can be bad at it, or you can be untrained yeah. at it, but if you have people for which you are responsible, you have assumed a leadership role, and you need to get good at it, and but you see, need to I, earn the right. And I, would, and I would push a little bit more on that. I'm less concerned with whether you call yourself a manager or a leader. Right, right, I'm more right. concerned with the language you use to describe the people entrusted to you, right? So if you, if you yes. say, oh, I have yeah. 200 people reporting to me, if you say yeah. I'm responsible for 200 people working, then we can work with that. Now, we right. call yourself a manager, a leader, a coach, a guru, I don't care. But if you understand that like that's your, those people are your responsibility, they don't report to you, it's not their responsibility to keep you happy, it's your responsibility to get them what they need to do, then, then I got something I can work with. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. David Burkus is our guest under new management. And the subtitle is how leading organizations are upending business as usual. And some of it probably is, is crazy. Let's talk a little bit about vacation policy. Yeah, I'm telling you, we saved the, the, the bottom half of the hour for this conversation <laughs> because I know this makes, I the, need more vacation. This makes the old guys really, really uncomfortable. <laughs> the, the, the prospect of wait, you can just leave as many times as you want for as long as you want. I, oh, yeah. I, I don't, that's absolutely mind blowing. No, and, this is for executives. And, and, right? then, and then I get called a snowflake and I'm precious <laughs> and it's, it's infuriating, but you talk about in the book True, and a lot of, and a lot of great companies have absolutely done away with PTO or vacation policies. So you're an adult, you're a professional. We trust you. Oh my gosh. They trust their people. We trust you that you're going to make the right decision and do what's best for the company. Uh, David, tell us about in your research what you found about the benefits of not having a vacation policy. Yes, a revolutionary concept, right? Treat, treating adults like <laughs> to adults. Say, easy, to say, easy. To say the Remember, least. our laborers don't have brains. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so a lot of this comes from that shift in the nature of work that we talked about before, right? When, when your job was to run a factory, you as a manager needed to know how many people were there so you could get the work done. If too many people took off on the same day, you can't run the factory, right? Right. The, the way that we work now is different and not really dependent on having everyone on the office in the same day. And, and as we shift from hourly or piece rate pay rates to salary work, we, we shifted to the idea that we give you objectives and you get those objectives done. You get those projects done. If it takes more, we're always quick to say if it takes more than 40 hours a week, oh, well, your salary. If it, we, we never actually point <laughs> out, though, that the inverse should also be true. If you can do it in 35, great. Right. right. But anyway. This this idea, and it's really not even a policy of unlimited vacation. It's a policy of just not having a policy around this, right. which scares a lot of people. But like, I, I don't know. I don't have a. You probably don't have a dress code policy at work, but no one shows up naked. 
right? People still feel like I should wear something. And then oh. usually they take cues from each other on what they should wear. Right. right. So and this is where this essentially came from. It, it it didn't start, but it was popularized by Netflix. They were one of the first ones right. to really promote this idea. And it came from the uh, uh, one employee essentially pushing back on Reed Hastings and saying the way that we work, you don't track when I come in. You don't track what I'm doing every day. You don't track the days we're here. Why do you need to track the days we're not here? And right. senior leadership didn't have a good answer. They saw that this was something that, that was annoying their people. They saw that a lot of times people were blending their work and vacations anyway. So they were checking in, doing a little bit of coding, what have you. So they basically said, okay, you know, forget it. We, we trust you, right? So work with your manager to decide when you can take off and it wouldn't be too big of a deal, but take as much or as little as you'd like. We trust you to know what's right for you. And, and when you look across all companies, what I think is really interesting is you see that on average, people take about the same amount of vacation days. It's, it's a little bit longer distribution. So some people take less, some people take more than they would have. But on average, it works out to be about the same. And I think that that's a big hint that actually this policy is about something else. It's not about finding the perfect magic number of days off that's right for everybody. It's actually about trust. It's actually about saying, you know what, we've been micromanaging you on this and there's no point in doing it, we trust you. And I think it's really telling that you know, trust is not earned, right? You don't earn, no matter what the media right now says about presidential candidates, trust is never earned, trust is reciprocated. You show trust to someone, they act trustworthy and in respond, they trust you. And you keep that upward cycle of trust, just like the way that you learn to trust your spouse or your best friend, right? Sure. It, it's a reciprocal process. Yeah, and, and this was and that first step. Use the phrase you always uh, use, and I'm totally stole from you many times, is we treat people like tenants, but expect them to act like owners. Right. Um, and and that that idea is, I mean, lost. Yeah, it's people. a big deal. In fact, you said it's about trust, and I almost wanted to interject and say, to me, it, it David, it's more like it's more about control. I mean, it, it, to to me, it's a Frederick Taylor style thing of, all right, we're going to tell you when to work and when you don't work, and how much you can have and how much you can't have. It's it's such a control thing. And, it, you know, sadly, this whole notion has come forward, what, four or five generations, uh, you know, and that we still have Taylor isms or mm -hmm. Taylor style management, if you will. Yeah. yeah, we definitely we drug them with us from the factory to the office. And, you know, we're just now figuring out that it all breaks down. But and it is it's 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 a shift from control to trust. I think it's really telling, though, is you see it as an as an upward uh, cycle of trusting people more and more. It's really telling that Netflix, after their unlimited vacation policy worked so well, they revamped their expense report policy mm -hmm. and they changed it to five words, act in Netflix's best interest, yep. which you could shorten even more to just be like, we trust you. Yeah. Do the right thing or yeah. we trust you or yeah, something right. like that. Yeah. So let, let me ask you, based on all the work that you've done, let, let's assume for a moment uh, that you become the CEO of a new company. You've got capital, you've got a good product or service, you've got resources, you've got people. Which of these things, and by the way, if you're joining us here on Blab, thanks for being here and on, on the uh, podcast as well. There's like 13 different things that David talks about in his book. We've only hit four or five of those. Which which of these would you adopt? Which which of those would you see is something truly beneficial that you would integrate into the company that you were the chief executive officer? Yeah, so so that's a rough question. Um, and and I, I've gotten it a couple of times and I'll, I'll answer it the same way I have there because I think it really speaks to all of these practices. There's yeah. already yeah, we're, 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 we're getting oh Wall Street gosh. Journal. All right, let's go. Right we're on CNN. So, so here's the deal. Almost all of these policies are actually policies of elimination. In other words, it's leadership seeing that something is getting in the way of their people doing their best work. Maybe it's feeling too controlled by the vacation policy. Maybe it's all the tension because nobody knows what everybody makes. But it's a, it's a process of elimination. Okay. So that's what I would do. I wouldn't say like this by far is the absolute best one. This is the brightest child of the bunch or what have you because so much of it depends on your culture, what's already going on. What I would do is I would look for things to eliminate. I'd look for stupid rules that need to be killed. I'd look for what are the barriers to our people doing their best work, and I would kill that. It would probably take the form of one of these 13, but even sure. if it didn't, as long as it's in that spirit of tearing down the barriers that are keeping people from doing their best work, then I'm all for it. Yeah, so I, I, and in that spirit of eliminating, I want to talk about open offices and 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 oh, collaboration wow. spaces. Oh, wow! And well, you're and, the millennial. You should love open offices. Oh my oh. gosh, I'm going to vomit on this one, Dave. I just tear him up. Just go to town. So uh, here's here's my point of view on these. I think that the idea of the open offices. I, I've worked in an office that was an open office. It was great. I mean, it's very collaborative. You you can chat. Um, 
However, really, really tough to actually get work, you know, get work done. When you, when you put your headphones in. <laughs> Which fits perfectly for you. Yeah. You don't get any work done, yeah. but we love it. When you put your headphones in and, and you're, you're pounding away on something, it's easy to go, excuse me, right? Instead of, it's very different, that barrier of the door. Right. Um, so I can argue pretty vehemently both sides of this coin. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, you mentioned in the book. C tell us what your research well, so, has I mean, shown you. So the research basically shows both sides of those coins, right? Okay. So, all right, so every everything has the good reason and the real reason, right? The, <laughs> right. the good reason for open offices is increase in collaboration, a sense of camaraderie, serendipitous meetings of the minds of people that don't normally interact, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's all the stuff we love to talk about. That's the good reason. The real reason is it's cheap. <laughs> Absolutely it's really right. cheap to furnish <laughs> yeah, an open office. Table, right? Cheap. <laughs> right, and I have, I have no data to refute the cheap thing other than there might be some costs there that are making that are skewing your ROI calculation, because while the, while the data definitely shows those things that that there are increases in collaboration, serendipitous moments, all of those sort of things, right. the the data also suggests that people are more likely to feel stressed, right? They're they're less productive as a whole. My my favorite study shows that people who work in an open office are more likely to call in sick to work which tells me they're either legitimately sick and you can make a case that germs spread faster in an open office, or they're just sick of their freaking open office where they can't get any work done. <laughs> they want to get some freaking work done. Yeah. Right. Yeah. In, in either case, you have an easily quantifiable loss of productivity in the number of people who just aren't there, aren't working, et cetera. So this is a, a really big problem. Everything has costs and, and benefits, right? And there are definitely benefits to open office. I don't deny that, but there are also costs. The, the, uh, the biggest issue, too, this is another sort of head fake thing where it's not actually about open versus closed. It's about when you're designing an office, it should be about how do you give perceived control over to employees to decide what type of environment they need to work in. Most of us don't do the same one task right. all day. We juggle a bunch of different types of work, and we need different environments for that. It's actually why a lot of people I've met since writing the book will tell me that they have an open office and so they disappear to the library across the street or they bought a co-working membership so they found somewhere they could go where nobody knows who they are uh, right. or, or they just save the really hard tasks for like a layover in an airport lounge or whatever it is right, right? and the idea is them desperately trying to grab onto that control again to go hey i want some ability to control the environment i work in and it turns out from an roi perspective one of the best things you can do for your employees is give them control over where they do that work. So you want to design an open office, great, but also design in some nooks that people can hide when they need to do deep work. Also design in some conference rooms where people can be loud and collaborative and not distract into other people. Give them kind of a, a palette of different places that they can pick and choose from as the needs of the work dictate. Yeah, and you, you really give them the ability to migrate to what, what's best for them. And I was going to ask, I mean, my sense is there's got to be some correlation to what people want based on their personality styles. You know, if I'm reserved and uh, task oriented, I probably like, you know, a cubicle or an office or something. And if I'm an outgoing, excited, task driven person, I probably want to be more out among the people is 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 that fair or is, yeah is, i mean so so introversion extroversion is not binary you there there are no just i'm an introvert i'm an extrovert correct. everybody's on a sliding scale yes and and that moreover sends the reason that you can't have a binary office you can't just be open for introverts or open for extroverts closed for introverts it's that sliding scale you need to give yourself control uh jacob actually even just commented in the chats that he's got an open office but he disappears to a coffee shop downstairs to actually get stuff done that's him trying to demonstrate control over his environment so that he can focus and be in the right environment for the right type of work. By the way, Jacob, that's brilliant. <laughs> well, I, I think that as we as we talk about, you know, that you bring up the introvert, but for me, often it's that analytical big brain introvert that I want to go tap on the shoulder and say, um, I don't want to get into the details, help, because that's not that's not my style, my strength. So right. and I know that drives that person crazy, but it, that that's the, I mean, we all know we, when we think about teaming and getting all the disparate personalities together, that makes the, makes the best team. I think I, I would want to push back and say, no, we don't want to give all the introverts offices because we need their help and we need their brains right. on this. So well, I true, think but if you're distracting them from doing the work they need to be doing to get what you need done, you're, you're causing them a loss in productivity. That's, I, I think, so. hold on. I think you missed the point that my, what I need to work on is more important. I think, oh, no, oh, I think, no, I think what you're saying yeah. is, that's called selfish. That's being selfish, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think it's a really, really interesting concept. And when we think about um, kind of as you summed up, David, the idea that this is all in a lot of ways about giving, a, you know, our people, and we think of them as 
a, an asset a, a, and, and something that we can get a higher ROI on when we give them that control. Um, mm. It's shocking that they often, I don't know, do the right thing. And I, um, I just love trust. your terminology, leadership by elimination. <laughs> I think that's what, what good leaders do is they look around and say, what's getting in the way and whatever it is, if it makes sense, we'll change it or eliminate it. You know, what we laugh about all the time is so many companies, David, are stuck in last millennia and, and their rationale is, well, that's the way we've always done it. I right. mean, is there any worse verbiage on the planet than that? Yeah. Or, or even if they're doing it in new ways, they're building on top of the old stuff that was designed. Yeah, exactly. Idea, right. Like nobody would say they're an advocate of Frederick Taylor's management, but Taylor influenced this person who influenced this person who influenced this person. And then they advocate for this. Right. right. I mean, uh, yeah, I could point to a bunch of different popular management and leadership books on a shelf and I could tell you who they have their roots in. My my point is if Taylor were alive today and studying the type of work that we had today, his ideas would have been different because the type of work changes yeah. as that changes how we manage it also needs to change. And that doesn't mean build on top to make modifications. That means wipe the hard drive, install a new operating system. Yeah, I think the biggest thing and what we see over and over and over is organizations don't teach managers how to even be managers much oh, less that's, that's exactly much less I leaders say, so, i mean too, yeah. we don't we don't do that so what do we do we watched how the guy our first manager managed us was he or she good or bad if good do like them if bad do the opposite of them and again it becomes binary so right. we, we we have over the time evolved and i think you hit the nail on the head i mean well and that's that's a question i have is I, I want to ask you because I know uh, if you don't know David, he's a professor uh, in at Oral Roberts University. He's an academic. He also works in the real world. He does all of these things, and you get a big, broad picture because you get all of the research and the real world stuff. But here's my question: Why don't more companies invest in training their leaders to be effective leaders? <laughs> I oh. hire a. I mean, exactly. well, yeah, yeah, shameless plug again, <laughs> so, right? So, I mean, it, it goes back to the old cartoon of like, what what happens if we invest in them and they leave, right? And right. and then of course the counter is what happens if we don't invest in them and they stay. Right. Um, you know, a lot of these things are unfortunately really hard to draw a straight line down to the bottom line on. They're very hard to calculate an ROA ROI. I mean, Drucker pointed out that not everything that matters can be measured, right? But we still love to measure stuff. And and honestly, I'm I mean, I'm part of the problem in this. I teach in a business school. Business schools really teach people to manage by spreadsheet, yeah. right? Manage by what you can what you can do. And and not everything that matters can be measured. And until we sort of have a curriculum that counterbalances that, which is the reason we need to invest in that type of training, right. um, because the analytical training that we got in business school or whatever will help us so far, but what got you here won't get you there, right? right. So we definitely need it. It's hard to see that need because we're swimming in trying to figure out based on what Excel tells us what our, our training budget should be. And that's, that's a hard calculation to make. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. David Burkus has been our guest. Hey, Dave, before we cut you loose, under new management, where would people find it? Where's the best place to go where you make the most money? <laughs> so where I make the most money, actually, uh, if you're listening to this and it is still July 2016, go to Amazon. You can grab it on Kindle for three dollars right wow. now. It's a really cool sale for the month of July. I paid full price. He I didn't know. even give me a copy. Well, the, the, the smart millennial will, will take the Amazon <laughs> sale. I agreed to be on your show because you bought it at full price. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, nothing so, like transparency, Dave. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> if it's not that, or if you already have a copy of the book and you paid full price, DavidBurkus.com. It's B-U-R-K-U-S is, is my website. There's a ton of free resources there about the book. And about some other stuff there. You can find out more on the book, on the podcast, Radio Free Leader, all of that sort of stuff there. So yeah, so davidberkus.com is probably the best place to start the conversation. Yeah, give us give us 60 seconds, 30 seconds on uh, your podcast as well. 141 episodes. You've had some great people on. Tell us a little bit about that and where people could find it. Yeah, so that's, I mean, davidberkus.com. This show's called Radio Free Leader. It's actually just me interviewing my intellectual heroes, uh, the people who I read their book and go, wow. That's why he asked us. That's why, that's why, that's why we're now on the show. All right, got it, got it. Okay. And so, and so, I mean, you get to listen into that, but I'll be honest, I do the show for me. Uh, and I <laughs> yeah. ask them all those questions. What I love is that it just so happens a lot of those questions happen to be what other people's questions are too. So we we bridge the gap between the ivory tower and the corner office, and we interview writers who, who do the same. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, Radio Free Leader is that. It's at davidberkus.com as well. Great stuff. David Burkus. Follow him on Twitter at David Burkus. We're going to take a quick time out. We'll be right back. We'll wrap this thing up. Great stuff, David. Thank you. It's called Countermanners. We do it every Monday, 4 o'clock Central Standard Time. 
and you can find us here live on the lab. That's where we like you to be because we like the interaction. People like Jacob and uh, some of the other people that have been commenting live on the lab. But of course, you can listen to us on iTunes as well. Subscribe to the podcast. Great and review that podcast for us. It always helps. You know, Great conversation with David Burkus. And um, some of this stuff's got to be blowing people away, right? Like making your pay transparent and getting rid of managers. And all that. That's crazy stuff. I mean, and, and I think it is making millennials and boomers alike uncomfortable. I mean, some of these things are truly radical and so different than what we learned. I mean, even at a, at a young age in school, right? You don't, you, everyone's grade isn't posted, right? You, right. you the, hand, the tests are handed back face side down. You know what I mean? So right. um, radical, radical changes. But I think as his book shows us, Really, really positive returns. Okay, but leadership you're... by elimination. I, I love yeah, leadership. I love Tra- room, trademark. Room. Ha- <laughs> we're, we're all rights reserved. D- dot com. <laughs> so yeah, we already got it. Don't even look. I, uh, here, so here's my question. The whole title of this episode is the millennial approved workplace. Right. All right. So right. you're you're millennial, right. sadly. Um, what 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 do you look for? And I mean, you're you're plugged into your guys, the yeah. people that you're around. You're yeah. around a lot of millennials. Yeah. You've worked in a lot of companies. Uh, various companies with different types of open and closed offices. Yep. What are, what are millennials looking for? As we go towards the end of the show, what are some of the tips you would throw out? Yeah, I think first and foremost, if you're a leader and you asked the great question to David, I mean, if you're CEO, what of these do you do? I think m- making an environment in your office, we're talking, talking specifically about the workplace, right. making your office a place where people can build relationships and have fun. I mean, there, there, there is a, a such a huge, huge and, return. And I just that was the sound of half the audience, boomers, turning it off and I'm, saying, "I'm done." No, building so, relationships and having fun. They're like, you know, we don't pay you to build relationships. And, and those are the same boomers that say they can't find good people. I mean, this well, is not. This yeah, is not a, I, mean, I mean, yeah, but you're confusing really me with facts stuff. now. <laughs> this is really simple stuff. I mean, people want to build relationships and find as we as Gallup told us, as Pink has told us, we want mastery and autonomy and purpose in and our, in our work. community, right? And, well, purpose, right? That's right. a purpose, I, a link to how it's better for, for the whole. So I think you need to create an environment but did where- But boomers want that too, son? I mean, are, are we really that vastly different? Well, we've talked about this. I mean, you were raised by a very different generation of workers who, right. who grew up in the Great Depression and, and they just did anything they could to get by. But, but when I came into the workplace, they all thought we were a bunch of whack jobs too. Well, you still are, though. I mean, that's the difference. I think that that hasn't changed. No, I, I think that the way we were raised it, wow. it was was very different. And so what we want and what we, in a lot of ways, demand out of the workplace is very different. So sure. create an environment where your people can build relationships, they can be together, um, and really they can have a good time. Because our generation, more than all of those before us, we put so much stock and so much importance and emphasis in our job and our career. It, it, it means so much to us. So uh, I know all, all my millennials out there, we want feedback. We want a sense of purpose. And that comes in an office where we facilitate communication and community. All right. So let me ask you, you, you talk about a sense of purpose. Uh, I'm going to get you know crazy here. Are you talking about save the whales kind of purpose? Or I mean, when you say purpose, that sounds, that sounds great. What does it mean? I think that it it Matt that I'm not just punching in. I I, I think yes, uh, you know, saving the whales or you know, as Tom's shoes is as a great example of this. You know, buying people that can't afford shoes, giving them shoes, right? That's great. But I think in in non uh, non profit in non non profit organizations that can be linking that you would back be to for the, profit. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I, it's good having you around every <laughs> once in a while. Um, in for profit <laughs> organizations, my minor I, contribution. I think that it's showing the link to the mission, to the vision, to the values, right? I mean, right. showing that what I do actually matters and what I do, I can see the link to how that is helping us achieve our mission and our goal. Because I mean, by the way, for, for millennials, we joined this company because we thought that this company was either doing something outstanding or would help us develop in ways that would help us be able to go do things that are outstanding. Okay. So what, what you're saying is part of that purpose can be the fact that I, if I join you, I'm going to grow and develop my career. I'm going to do something worthwhile as it impacts what you're doing as a company. It doesn't have to be necessarily saving lives or you know something spectacular. It's just I have to understand my role in in, in the success of the company, so to speak. Ab- absolutely. And I think if any time as a, especially millennials, I think most, most people, but as millennials, especially, we have such a strong sense of, we want to continue to develop. We want to continue to grow and we want to feel like what we're doing truly matters. Um, and I think that's, 
been amplified over the course of, of you know our generation over the last 20 years. Yeah, well, future show, I can tell you, we're gonna we're gonna attack job descriptions. That's my number one personal <laughs> rant. Is that uh, we unwittingly we boomers because we've bought into all of this nonsense and HR has a sort of specific function, uh, you know, to create the human resource management piece. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Job descriptions, are, you talk about a train wreck. I mean, we're going to have to use a different word, but right. a dumpster fire. <laughs> job, <laughs> job descriptions are a dumpster well, fire. Well, no, they, they've become like annual performance reviews, like meetings in many ways. Yeah, they've uh, become CYA activities. I mean, we are keeping ourselves from getting sued or somehow someone being able to claim that we didn't hire them because, you, you know what I mean? But, but we're unwittingly creating functionaries. Here's a list of functions Absolutely. or tasks Absolutely. that you do. Don't there's, engage your brain. Just do what's on That's right. Screen. And that's there's right. nothing in there about mission, vision, values. There's no context. Yep. There's no intent of the role, what we're yep. trying to accomplish, how you fit into the big picture, right. what our purpose is. There's nothing. Well, it's it's back to the Netflix model. Uh, Burke has alluded to this. Um, our, our expense report policy is do what's right for the company. And if we could extend that to um, to job descriptions and other things, I mean, talk about the power of unleashing. Now, think about this. If you work in an organization, think about all the different people that work in that organization. Now think of all of those that feel like their voice is not heard. They're not encouraged to use their brain. And think about if all of them were, right? If they were encouraged to think yes. and to uh, you know engage and do what is needed for the company to do what's right for the company, how powerful that organization could be <laughs> and how much better the bottom line would be. I got a chuckle. Jacob uh, on Blab sending a message to us. He said, but we millennials shouldn't act so needy for F affirmation. <clears throat> Speak for yourself. Uh, and, and sometimes we just need to buckle down and be willing to do some unglamorous work. You know, I, I'm, I mean, I appreciate that he says that because there, there is a middle ground there. We, we boomers are not always doing things that we like to do, but we have to keep the organization going. Dude, Jacob's an accountant. All right. So everything he does, Dude, you're bagging is, on, is, is, you're bagging is on his unglamorous. I mean, <laughs> we're talking about Excel spreadsheets. I'm, he has one of those calculators on his desk too. And he like pulls the, that's not, it's called that, a slot that right? machine. That's a slot <laughs> machine. <laughs> I think that's, I think that's, that's so Hey, fun. the new millennial approved workplace episode number 12 counter mentors.com is where you can find past episodes, information on the upcoming episode. You can find us how to get connected to iTunes and connected Robbie and I, and by the way, we've got a brand new video that we just, just uh, finished up <laughs> yesterday. It sure. was a lot of fun. We've got some more coming, but you can find that brand new video on the homepage of countermentors.com. But suffice it to say, son, the millennial approved workplace, from my perspective, is not all that different from just any normal human being who wants to be valued, who wants to have purpose, who wants to contribute, who wants to grow and develop. Sure. I mean, we I, just I haven't been paying a lot I of attention. I don't disagree. The difference is our generation has Again, we said this, more to offer than ever before. You're We're sensitive. coming into the workplace with skills and talents that are not there. So we have the opportunity, uh, and I would say we have the responsibility to demand a different level. Hey, by from the way, the before we get away, we just got a couple of minutes. How frustrating is it to work in an organization where the executives all act like you know you don't know anything, and they really can't do things like you know, communicate on smartphones or, I mean, there's some pretty sophisticated apps that even that we use, but what, what is that like when, when you're just like, really, come on. Well, it's incredibly frustrated when, and, and I've actually had very real conversations with uh, colleagues and friends that have said, you know, my boss, he or she <laughs> can't even do blank, but they're telling me that I can't be involved in strategic planning or I can't be involved in, you know, setting in, in this work. You think just because you can work an iPhone, you know, strategy. No, but I think that because this is a perfect, absolutely perfect metaphor, because I can work an iPhone, I understand and have a much different paradigm. And I look at problems so you, differently than you, you know, that, I about should, that I should be in that meeting <laughs> because there's clearly things you don't understand or don't know. And you look at the world differently than I do that I can add value in that meeting. Sure, you know what? I might not know, I might not know McKinsey's uh, 5S model, but you know what? Or 7S model, but you know what? I can sit down and th talk, think about this from a customer experience point of view, right. from a technology point of view, right. something that you have no clue. You're, what you're, you're trying to about. show off your MBA knowledge right there. So the, uh, yeah, that was good. Thank I, you. I really like the star model. <laughs> the star model as well. Hey, it's uh, it's been a blast. I hope you've gotten something out of it. And boomers, I hope you've been paying attention because there is a lot to learn about how to leverage that younger generation. And there's nothing son quite like being in a strategic planning meeting. I've done many of those uh, facilitate strategic planning for a living and listening to a bunch of old boomers talk about social media and denigrate it. <laughs> like, you know, that's the internet thing. I don't think it's going to last. <laughs> yeah. The Google machine. You think I thought it did everything. 
Well, if we use that tweeter, I'm not sure it really would work for us. No, I, I is it is it tweeter? Faceplant. Uh, my my book. Yeah. My, okay. My got, book. It. got it. Got it. Got it. Oh my goodness. Hey, that's gonna wrap it up for us. We'll this is Counter Mentors with Kelly and Robbie Riggs. Finally, a place where you can get both perspectives on challenges in the workplace from a boomer. Uh, you rolled our intro. And I rolled the intro. Oh, okay, hold on. Oh, the counter mid show. Is the live show. <laughs> I'm telling you guys, if you can see Pops' setup here. Hold on. Oh, there, that's an outro. That's an outro. Y'all be good. Come on! Thanks for tuning in to Counter Mentors with Kelly and Robbie Riggs. The show airs every Monday at 4 p.m. Central. Watch the show live on Blab or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. For more information about the show, to listen to past shows, or to learn more about how Kelly and Robbie teach companies the counter mentoring process, visit countermentors.com. The Counter Mentor Show is presented by One on One Media Incorporated. All rights reserved. Opinions expressed by guests on the show may not be the opinions of One on One Media or the host of the Counter Mentor Show.